Hello, everyone. Good morning, and a very, very happy weekend to all of you. This is uh, Devi Shobha from Kids Kinta, and today we are here to, um, you know, for the second of our four-week special series with My Child First. Um, the series is called Womb to the World, and this series, um, you know, the the main objective of this series is to uh, talk about. Um, you know, uh, what a mom uh, or uh, a parent uh, has as, uh, you know, as powers to influence uh, the, you know, the, the, the baby's life. And it is much more than we think, uh, much more than meets the eye. And the last week we had a very, um, you know, I, I, I would say a very eye opening and a very emotional discussion uh, with Divya. Uh, we discussed what uh, happens in utero and how the mom has the uh, ability uh, to control her own environment in the sense that she can uh, she can understand uh, that I mean she needs to understand that happiness is not just happiness is not positive uh, environment but you know the ability to maintain the neutrality I think that is the most important takeaway from uh, you know, my talk with Divya last week. Uh, so please do revisit that talk if you missed that. And today we are here to discuss um, a very, very intriguing topic. Usually, uh, you know, when um, the mom uh, is carrying the child, the delivery is uh, left to, I mean, the, the, uh, the vaginal or C-section delivery is a big decision. For, for the mom and uh, for the parents, but especially for the mom because it's her body that is involved. Uh, but we also forget that there is another very important entity involved in this decision and that is the baby itself, right? Uh, what happens, so the, the C-section, usually we hear advice from everyone, the elders and from even good doctors saying that, you know, vaginal delivery is good uh, because it is the way of nature, right? It's not really advisable to go against nature if we can help it, right? But what we do not hear is how it affects the child. And today we are here with uh, Divya Deswal of uh, My Child First here again to discuss this in detail. I'm so looking forward to this. Um, to give you a small introduction about uh, My Child First, My Child First was uh, co-founded by Divya and her uh, partner Tanvi uh, with a mission to educate, integrate and respond to parents and parents-to-be uh, and equip them with all the information on all aspects of childbearing and child rearing. So it is a uh, you know, holistic parenting um, advice, counseling, and uh, solutions kind of a platform. And Divya Deswal here is a certified childbirth educator with over two decades of experience as a birth doula. She's also a hypnobirthing childbirth educator. She's a fertility practitioner, a biodynamic craniosacral therapist, and she has held the hands of more than 350 women and couples during pregnancy in the last 10 years. So her experience speaks for herself. Welcome, Divya. This is such a pleasure to have you again with us. Thank you, very Shobha. It's really nice to be here. And yes. I was hearing what you were saying, and there were so many thoughts that were popping in my head. And, uh, you know, there's, there's such a vast topic. And right. unfortunately, it's broken down to pros and cons of one over the other. Mm. So, um, you know, right off the bat, let's say if we don't say the word delivery for a moment mm. and we say the word birth of a child, mm. does that change anything for us? I think it makes so it a, more of a human experience. Correct. But also delivery, when you get, and these are the days of online deliveries, when you're getting things delivered, who does the work? You or somebody else? Somebody else. The person who delivers right. right and so the when we started to call birth delivery we gave up the power of bringing that life in the world from ourselves to somebody outside ourselves an expert mm. again the words you used vaginal delivery as if the vagina is the most significant thing or surgery c-section 
Uh, we interchange the word vaginal delivery with normal delivery with natural delivery as if they are all the same. And then he has now added another thing on the buffet of deliveries that how would you like to receive your child natural, normal, vaginal or cesarean. And for a moment it seems that it's a choice between equals. It's like mm. saying, should I have South Indian food or Italian food? But it's not so. Mm. And I'll give you a very simple example before I jump into the normal natural part. Just between C-section and other kind of birth. Let me give you a very simple example. Breathing. There's a mechanism for breathing. Do you see us all running around trying to put ourselves on ventilators? No. Do you see us carrying a puff? or incessantly doing inhalation? No, because we trust that this nose, the, the passageway that goes in the bronchial tubes and our lungs will be there for us till, till we die. Nobody ever second guesses their breathing. Otherwise, how would you sleep at night? You are not in charge. What if you don't breathe? So, a medical intervention, and I'm not only talking sur surgery, I'm talking any medical intervention should be approached with the same idea, philosophy, not even caution. I'm not even going to use the word caution because this polarizes it with the same ideology that I this is designed to breathe. When I feel such a congestion, I am wise enough to do some inhalation. And if that doesn't work, I can read those signs and go to a doctor, get a nebulizer, and even if need be, go on a ventilator or get a lung transplant. But the wisdom of knowing this lies within me. The choice is not from outside. So yeah. knowing that I can breathe, birth is like that. So surgery would be the, the, the ventilator part of it. And therefore cannot be the same as breathing and therefore birth cannot be looked in surgical terms as equal to giving birth what nature has designed. What we call normal and vaginal are also variations. Natural means it happens on its own, nobody does anything and every system is designed. When we start to interfere with it, whether we are inducing, whether we are taking a drug, whether we are taking a pain relief, we are changing something. Again, holding neutrality here, not giving it a right and wrong. There may be a reason when that C-section saves a life because waiting for the baby to come out to the process might be dead. So is C-section good or bad? Only circumstances can decide. Right. Um, definitely the, the, the rate at which it is happening now is not quite natural. Right? Just... Think of it for a moment that if 30, 40 or 50 percent women cannot reproduce, then what is the hope for human race? Whether we can't conceive naturally, if whether we can't carry babies to term without effort or we can't give birth. The species depends on our ability to reproduce. And in some cases, I'd like to I'm horrified to say that 70% of women cannot give birth. Then that means that species is coming to an extinction. Wouldn't you say that? I mean, that's a very rational way of looking at it. So in, under what, what circumstances out of your experience for the last decade that you have uh, helped birth so many children uh, and helped so many women through the process, under what circumstances do you think a C-section should actually be advised uh, to a pregnant woman. Okay, so there is no absolute here because we are talking about a woman with her experience and a care provider with their experience and fears. Let's first get that clear, that not all C-sections and all risks are absolute risks. Different care providers will look at different things in different ways. Like, like people are different. Like if I have a headache, I prefer coffee. Usually I feel when I have coffee, my headache goes away. Whereas somebody else might say, I take an aspirin. Somebody else might take even a heavier drug. 
somebody say, no, I don't want coffee because that's caffeine. I'll put a bomb. So different people approach different things from their own perspective. And doctors do have a perspective. A, their education. B, uh, their own experience. And C, their preference. So you will hear that C-sections are being suggested for many variety of things. But if you go back to my original understanding, the, the philosophy that I presented, it is absolutely warranted at a time when you can say with certainty that a baby or the mother cannot wait in this egg pregnancy or, you know, or they have no other choice. That's the only point. Even when you're looking at something evolving, emerging, say, uh, for, for, for that matter, uh, you know, something is happening with her, maybe with her diet, maybe with her medical markers. That's not the point of C-section. You might say that looking at what we are doing, the baby may need to come out early, but we are not there yet. So C-section is like an absolute, it's now or never. That's the point of C-section. Not uh, when it can be handled, when it can be uh, monitored when it can be seen. So a lot of people get induced out of, uh, you know, their doctor says, oh, we cannot wait, there is harm to the child, let's induce you. So you are saying that there is harm to the child, but we can wait 24 hours giving you drugs. So then it's not an emergency. You know? So these sections are primarily when it's now or never, we cannot wait. Right. In labor, if it's a labor, one of the things it would be a consistently low heart rate. I don't, Sorry, I don't know that. why it's happening, but the baby's not doing well. Let's get him out now or get her out now. That may be a reason. So what, according to you, is uh, some of the repercussions for the baby when uh, he or she is delivered by a C-section procedure? OK, so that's not an easy question to answer because it puts things in black and white. And the mm. thing that it does is creates guilt regret and we want to avoid that we don't want women to feel bad about decisions so let's talk about the human spirit here and let's understand what the baby does so the baby has a sequence we all have sequences we all make transitions with sequences we have an intention say uh, you know going for a journey uh, then we do some preparation buy the ticket find out what is it what's the good weather to go there then uh, do some action, which is take a flight, go there, then do a follow through. And then after that sequence, we take rest. So there is a sequence. For the baby being born, there is also a sequence. Uh, so the baby starts with an intention, which you find that the baby turns head down and starts to lower in the pelvis. That's an intention and a preparation. Knowing that I want to be born, and how will I be born? The, to the vagina, so let me turn around and start moving downwards. That's a preparation. Action is labor when it does the movement to try and get out of the, uh, the, uh, the pelvis. The push with its, with its feet emerging out, that's action. Then when it rests with the mother, that's follow through. Um, you know, meets the mother, does the skin to skin, does the breastfeeding, and then the baby sleeps. That's right. So the baby has a sequence through the womb. Now, when these are disturbed, depending on at what point the C-section was done, that creates a bit of a confusion for this baby. There is a certain drive, there's a certain energy in the baby to complete the sequence, and that's what it. Think that you are about to you're angry, you're in an action phase and you lift your hand, maybe to slap somebody, and then you control it. What does your arm feel? It feels a lot of activation energy, ready to do something, and then being pulled back. There's a bit of a frustration around it. There's a bit of a disorientation around it. So depending on where the C-section came and what happened before that and what happens after that, and how this sequence is able to be completed will depend on the consequences of the baby. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, for example, if the baby started the labor uh, spontaneously, 
which means the intention, the preparation, some amount of action is completed, but couldn't come out. So there was a C-section, there was a little bit of a disorientation, but then the baby was given to the mother skin to skin and the follow through. And, you know, mostly it was protected in its sequence. Those babies may have no um, effects of C-section, very little, which they can metabolize, integrate very quickly, process very quickly through their body. Some babies are scheduled for C-section. They've not even given a chance to prepare. Hmm. Some babies are breech and C-sections. They've not been given a chance to have a conversation why instead of going down, you are going up. The, the, the respect around C-section is more important. Then the second part is what is the baby metabolizing through the mother? So when we are cornering women in, uh, you know, to C-sections, when we are making them afraid, when we are, you know, putting them, making them feel hopeless and helpless, and the sequence is thwarted, how does that feel for them? That would be a whole different thing. So it's not, it's a, it's a complex question because human beings are complex. There is something that happened to me. It was a little bit. I got, then I got support. It was okay. There was a whole environment of fear and I was jerked out of my mother and taken to away from her and I don't know what was happening to me. What would that do to my psyche? That's the second thing. The third thing is very physical, which is there are certain mechanisms set in the baby to function because of the process of giving birth. The compression that he feels or she feels while coming out of the birth canal, both on the chest and on the head, is not the same when they are pulled out hmm. from, a, a, from a surgical site. So the neck has a very different physical sensation. The body has a very difficult physical sensation. When the baby hmm. comes from the birth canal, he swallows vaginal fluid. That hmm. lines his gut to help him with digestion. So there's a really variety of bacteria for the gut. But when they mm. come out of the surgical side, there's more skin bacteria than vaginal bacteria. So there are these micro changes that happen. The pressure on the baby, the temperature changes, the process itself, their own ability to kick and push themselves out versus being lifted up. Mm. Compression versus pulling. Mm. These also affect them. And all of this we know. I mean, well, most of us know or Few of us know, whoever knows. But what we also must understand and really celebrate is the spirit of humanity, the ability to heal. How we come back from these transitions, how we recover, how we rebound are equally important. So C-section mm -hmm. actually takes away the mother's ability to meet the baby because she's had a surgery. So it's because not one is. assault. We just, you because know, the, the baby needs the mother immediately after birth both in contact and, and emotionally available. And C-section might take that away because she cannot get up, because she cannot hold the baby. So it's not one assault. It could be a series of things that multiply or, you know, stack up for the baby. Uh, mm. In a scheduled C-section, the lungs may not be fully ready. Mm. It's a window. Mm. Even if, so, you know, when people say, why should we wait for labor to start? We are already at 40 weeks. I said, maybe the last eyelash is being made. You want mm. the baby to complete. Then right, the right. last hair on the head, the last eyelash, the tiniest bit of finger hair. I mean, that's a mm. very simple way of saying that the, the baby is not coming out because something is going on. Yes, yes. And even that one day might be the difference. So again, the only reason we might take away that one day or two days or three weeks from the baby is because staying in is dangerous for them or more. And that should be the point. Mm. Here's why coming out. I see. So you mentioned something called, uh, you know, having a conversation with the baby. You mentioned the breech baby. <laughs> uh, so how does that happen? Uh, so if the baby is in breech position and uh, is there a way to communicate with the baby? And There's always a way. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are certain circumstances where C-section is absolutely necessary. Uh, so 
so in in so i'm just trying to understand like uh, how can a mother obviously because she doesn't have a medical background not all mothers do have uh, so how what is a good basis for this kind of a decision so can i break it into two parts because there's a very important one first part is that 30 40 years ago care providers did vaginal birth hmm surgery was still evolving not so good equipment not such good uh, antibiotics or drugs so vaginal breaches were safer than c section but surgery is more harmful than vaginal mm -hmm. and there are many many great care providers in the world today who still catch babies so the the fact that we say that breech baby should be a c section is a is a education process that says that for my practice i believe the risk of vaginal breach is more than c section when the say risk of c section surgeries was greater than vaginal birth people caught babies breech so it's not a final uh, verdict right now if the baby's nature when i say the word nature biology says that to be born turn down and physicality which is the head grows bigger the spine gets heavier so you know floating in water the head automatically tends to come down i mean think of it from a from a physics point of view mm. as the baby's head grows and the brain gets volume the head turns down when that is the law of nature what is keeping the baby up like i said this is a process that nature has perfected over eons so there is firstly the pelvis which is a hard surface that you have to negotiate now because of our modern living we are not bilaterally symmetrical or we are not very balanced on both sides uh, you know simply because if we drive or we sit in cars and we wear a seat belt this suppose i drive so i take a seat belt like this this shoulder is fixed and my hips are fixed but i live in delhi and delhi driving is all about this but my body can't do this so it does this because this side is fixed so this one turn so there may be twists in our spine especially in the in the tissues that does not balance the hip and mothers can know when they rotate their hip whether left and right feel the same then the joints at the back one may be tighter than the other and when the hip is not very balanced the baby may not find that place to go in so that's hard tissue then because of all our living our you know tissues are are stresses our musculature may be tight so those could act muscles of the uterus muscles or, or the ligaments that hold the uterus may be tight so releasing those can help the baby turn now old midwives say that when uh, the mother is stressed the baby comes closer to the mother's heart too uh Yeah, you know to help her to tell her that i love you though you're not alone as beautiful but it could be that a stressed mother the baby may be coming closer to our heart because the rhythm of the heart is very very relaxing so we talk to the mother about her emotions what are her fears can she let them go uh doctors are capable of doing or turning the baby with adequate fluid which is called the external cephalic version there are so many we can use acupressure to invite the baby so we can also use the baby's own system so you know you could um, put cold peas packet on top baby moves away from the cold you could put mm. a torch between the legs in a dark room father can call to the baby from the lower parts and come on baby this is the way to go mother can talk to the baby you can play music at that end so using the baby's senses to invite the baby in the right mm. position and then there is that really deeper uh, soulful conversation of saying what's going on with you mm. you know what is it that you know about this part that i don't understand because my information is cognitive your information is from a place that i haven't seen and so can you tell me and that's the point of surrender for the mother and you know you can also go to um, um maybe you can go to the uh, you, you know baby and say the current care that i'm getting you know 
uh, is what is uh, saying that now we have to do a season. So is that what you want? And you'll be surprised how babies can respond. So I Wonderful. kind of call it a, 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 a gross to subtle intervention for breach. Heart That's tissues, right. soft tissues, relaxation, fears, emotions, and then soul connection. Great, awesome. I think that was very, very enlightening. Uh, now that we, you know, we had this, you know, uh, we touched upon what the baby might be missing out on because of the sudden, uh, because it is taken by surprise. The baby, for the baby, it is a surprise. The mom is prepared, but not the baby as such. So uh, I don't know if I can use the term negative, but what can we do? I mean, as moms, if you know, we have had C-section uh, births. What are some recommended, uh, you know, practices that the mom can follow now to, you know, maybe repair some of the uh, agency that we took away from the baby? That is what I can, uh, you know, I can summarize it as. What can we do now? So depending on the age of the baby, if the baby is just born, can just mm -hmm. return to habitat. And then over a period of time, keeping the baby closed is telling him that, yes, there was a rupture and it was needed, but we are safe now. That's a huge step you can take. Also, acknowledging the mother's loss, giving birth in itself is a rite of passage for women. They've lost her. Whether they've chosen it or not, I really don't care. When a mother chooses a C-section out of fear, we have truly, that is also a law. So again, it's not blaming anybody, but recognizing that the circumstances of her life, or she didn't have enough support, or her own fears, and she is who she is, recognizing it. So, so a little bit of a repair for a mother as well. You lost an experience or you didn't even get a chance to have an experience out of, you know, um, pressures of outside or or, uh, or or fear. And that itself is huge. And then I think saying sorry is a very good thing if you mean it. Apology, uh, sincere apology has a great healing quality. So if, uh, you know, she can tell herself, if nobody else is there, a family says it that we recognize you lost something precious, how can we nurture you? That's amazing. But if they can't, can she say it to herself? Acknowledge. I was fearful. I felt no support. This is the best decision I took. I'm sorry. And then also um, to the baby that you were shocked. Um, you felt alone. It must be terrible. I'm sorry. But I'm here now. And you are here now. We survived. See, if you are doing a C section really for danger to the mother and the baby, acknowledging that we have survived is great power. That we survived and we are here now. I love you. I work with you. So these are some of the things you can do when the baby is really small. But the, but the story doesn't change as you grow up. Once babies are more cognitive, you know, um, they can talk to each other. Um, they can use language. You can also look at, you know, um, some of the things that you may see as patterns in their behavior. Like they may do a lot of intention, preparation, action, but when it's time to follow through, they give up. And you'll find those sequences are repeated. That rupture of sequence may be repeated in many transitions of their life. It's interesting, no? Because that's the imprint from their birth from C-section. And when you see that, you could talk to them. You could say, tell me how you feel when you are ready to give up. And they may say that, then you can kind of bridge that experience to this. There are really good somatic therapists who can do that. That's, that's what somatic experience and CSP is all about. The reason I took up these uh, trauma modalities is because I work with babies and mothers. So how do we, uh, what do we really need to do for this psychological side effect is we've got to give them the space and the resource to process and integrate it through their nervous system, and then it becomes a past. How does a memory in the past stay in the past, and how does it become trauma in the present? 
because at that time you did it and it's okay it's over and you recognize that it is over you are not feeling the fear of it now so when we can do that for babies as they grow up even toddlers even uh, you know young children as 18 months old we can work with that they can uh, you know uh, i've seen babies complete their birth sequences they will go from under the mother's arm pushed with their legs and be born again and yeah now that's over i've done it who you have grown up children who can talk about these sequences how they are affecting their life and you'll say you know people again stop judging saying you know is ki yeah ye itna sab shuru karte hai aur pura to karte not relating that there's a fear of completing it because it was disrupted at that time so therapy can help them there are many ways to reach it uh, what they lose in terms of uh, say microbiome good diet breastfeeding mother's contact there are many many ways of repairing at different levels of what c section can do for us but even acknowledging um, that you know this is a big disruption and using it cautiously <laughs> in itself would be a great uh, byproduct of just understand right so we do have a question here thank you very much for that so here tanvi asked can you also talk about the effects of in induction from the baby's point of view uh yeah. and we do have i do have a follow up question on that uh so would you recommend mothers to try home remedies to get themselves into labor if they have crossed their estimated due date okay. so so i'm sure the two <laughs> Let's start with the word induction. No matter how you do it, your intention of induction means get the baby out. Mm-hmm. Does the baby know why you are in a hurry to throw him out of his home? What would it feel like you for you to be yanked out of your home because your time is up? And that time is arbitrary. It's not a lease on a doc. It's not a lease document for a house rental. Ki bhaiya, you have to leave. so induction again changes that sequence mm. the baby may be in preparation phase and now is pushed down and whacked out so think oh, what an induction would do an induction would actually make the contractions really strong evicting the baby it feels like eviction being hurried along so from the baby's point of view they don't know why you're in a rush to get them out especially if inductions are done only because of due date an arbitrary date which by their own document says plus minus 2 weeks but we are using that date as a land- it's not a landing of a plane so edd says this is your due date plus minus 2 weeks but then we use the same date to induce because all oh, your time is up so very literally feels what went wrong and that's now when we bring in home inductions what is really important what is the baby really reading it's reading intention and if okay. when you are using home induction what are some home inductions some active pressure maybe you know having a, a certain kind of food spicy food maybe um you know nipple stimulation what is your intention behind it is your intention to prepare your body so if i am having a particular herbal tea is it to prepare the tone of my my uterus or is it to get the baby out because intention matters at that level baby understands intention very deeply what does it matter so what is your intention you've never taken homeopathy in your life you don't believe in it but then the doctor says oh, if you want normal birth start homeopathy mm-hmm. you start ingesting what is your thought process what is your emotion what is your bio, bio body's chemistry neurobiology around that action that is as important as the induction itself so is the induction good or bad neutral is c section good or bad depends on the circumstances so home inductions whether we call them natural the minute we say the word natural we think it's fun but it isn't because an induction still means get out before it's your time so how you attempt them am i getting foot massages and acupressure because it's relaxing and it builds the tone of my body or am i desperate to get the baby out before a day so that i don't have to do an induction and you know depending on where my intention is that is where it is matter my personal bias and this is personal simply and it's not to be used by others because it's a way a radar of knowing myself i would say 
I'm happy to do an acupressure than to ingest something. Because in, when I eat something, I cannot take it out. But an acupressure point will stop the pressure. Over a period of time, my body will integrate. So for me, that's one of the this things that I don't want to. But um, uh, home inductions, we know them from time immemorial. If all dadi can use dais do it all the time. But they don't do it in terms of getting the baby out. They do it to build the body. You're building the body because you know my body can do it. If you're beating a deadline, that feels very different to the baby than when you're building the body and you're singing about meeting the baby, how I'm doing this, I can't wait to meet you, you'll be here soon, versus, oh my God, I have to go into labor before this date, otherwise, deadline. It's very different. Right. So intentions. Right. So we do have a question from Sanya here. Uh, she says, I was in my 39th, 39 weeks of pregnancy. The doctor had suggested that my baby's head circumference is big and keeping my height and weight in my natural birth wasn't possible. Before any intervention could take place, I started bleeding. That was the day I had a C-section and my baby was born. I was given general anesthesia because local anesthesia didn't work on me. Was this C-section necessary? Secondly, for over two years, my, um, my baby faced night terrors where he would get up from his sleep roughly. Yeah, so general anesthesia is due in, in our trauma world. It's a whole sector where there is a gap in your life. Now, she says that, firstly, I don't agree with that the head circumference was very big because babies' heads mold. So the two parietal bones ride each other and they become narrower. So that's not a, that's not a, a diagnosis that I agree with. We can only determine whether the baby can come out or not when we arrive there. There's no other way of or if we know for sure that the mother has a problem with the pelvis and it is misshapen for a particular reason, which could be malnutrition or an, uh, or an accident. But I don't believe that heads don't pass through pelvises. It's again, law of nature says procreate, not stop babies from being born. So if everything is good, the circumference of the head cannot decide how the baby is going to be born. Neither can the weight of the baby. So I want to be very clear. Then she said that uh, she had bleeding. Unless I don't have clarification on bleeding, I cannot say if it was a good decision. Bleeding could be rich, fresh blood pouring out of her. Or bleeding could look like a few drops of blood in mucus. The first is an emergency or could be an emergency. The second could be the mucus. So really, you can't just hear bleeding and judge it. If it was the if it was fresh bleeding coming out, uh, then the section was, was life and death. The placenta may have abrupted, lots of bleeding may have come out, and the baby needed to be taken out immediately. It's a good decision. If it was the second, it was not a good decision. So really, to judge somebody's birth story in terms of right and wrong without knowing all the aspects would be really foolhardy because it creates stories for them that they cannot get past. So fresh blood for it out. Um, I'm reading it. Um, yeah. 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 So then it's fresh blood pouring out that you know that there is an injury or something happening in the womb where fresh blood is coming out. And then they have checked and the blood placenta may have been abrupt. I mean, I'm conjecturing here again. It's just what makes sense to me. And C-section therefore Right. In this case, it saved life. Now, the second part is the general anesthesia. So the local didn't work on her. Or did they even try? I don't know. Probably they didn't try it because it was an emergency and they wanted to get the baby out as soon as possible. Which, again, from a medical point of view or even from a life point of view, in that emergency, can make sense. And then we can do the repair for, for general anesthesia, you know, by telling the baby to stop it. But the fact is that the mother has lost connect. Remember last time you were telling about Abhimanyu and when his mother slept, 
he didn't hear. So as soon as the mother got out of her body, general anesthesia, the baby may have felt the disconnect completely. And then, of course, the sequence is broken with the abruption of the center. I don't know how the baby may have felt about life and death. And therefore, there's a lot of trauma there, which, which we can appreciate, which we can understand. So can we do repair now? Lots of love. So what would happen if your baby would wake up and arise at night? You would soothe them, you would stay with them, you would... And the mother's love, remember last time I said, is the biggest shield for a baby in utero and outside. So. Yeah, so the night terrors, again, uh, affirmation, love affirmations, and then... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But also some body work would have helped, you know, Therapeutic session with body work would be cranial sacral therapy. Uh, I, I, I practice it. I'm a great fan of it. I learned it because of mothers and babies, because it's a touch therapy, and babies are highly tactile. And their stories are very short. They don't have years of experience layering on it. So when they're small, you're meeting them where they are. It's very easy to do repair work. Awesome. But also to yeah. say to Sanya that that must be a really difficult time for you and and quite a loss of the of receiving your baby with joy so we have life. yes we recognize that we see that we hear that yes especially because of the general anesthesia yeah because of everything also blood pouring out doctor saying you know this is an emergency the shock of it must be too much so it's not just a baby i'm sure she has to Yes. yes. So, Sanya, I hope you're hearing this. So, <laughs> thanks for being such a brave mom. Um, Divya, we do have another question here. It's from Ria Mehta Bhatia. She asks, is it possible to have a natural birth with pelvic girdle pain? Does the pubis symphysis pain get worse? Um, I'm not quite sure that I am fully qualified to answer that question. Um, because uh, we, we might want to weigh in a good physiotherapist and your care provider in this situation to take a full notes on what is going on. But people with pubis simplicity pain can give birth. Mm. They can. If there are other things that are involved, so pubic simplicity pain basically means the joint in the front is beginning to open up and there's pain there. But what could be the causes of that happening will also determine then what the care would be like. But for a lot of people whose joints soften and the pain comes up, it could be one of the joints at the back is more tight, so the, the forward one is compensating. Could be other, I, I'm not quite sure how I how to answer that, but as a generalization, women with pubis and first pain, you know, when the pelvis open, do give birth. Okay, sounds good. So, um, I'd like to, uh, you know, ask you one question. Uh, yeah, one question, in fact. So, in this case, so usually um, when when moms um, encounter the first possibility of a C-section, it is usually the case that they're hearing it, uh, you know, from a doctor, right? So, it's very hard to convince a medical professional uh, that you know, um, especially in India, uh, that I, you know, the, the uh, I to use their agency and say I want to do it this way because of course there's fear playing and then there is also uh, lack of uh, uh, you know the the assertive communication. I mean there is no there is no possibility of that. I feel that. You know, it is only a one-way communication usually in in medical scenarios, especially in these cases when you you also have the pressure of family, uh, you also have the pressure of uh, you know your own uncertainties within your body. You have your anxiety and all of that. So, what is a good way to feel sure first of all about how you're feeling, and secondly, what is a good way to communicate, especially with a medical profession? So your relationship with the medical professional is at least from 12 weeks to the time of birth. Right. Right. How much have you prepared and educated yourself about the baby and yourself? That'll be the first step. Because what you don't know, 
always creates fear. Last minute running around to find out other people's opinion rarely helps. Now, if you are already a person who's taken charge about their body, about their health, about their care, you will begin to find that either your relationship with your uh, with your doctor, with your care provider is smooth, which means you'll ask a question, they'll answer. So things like, do I have to get this scan? No. Or why do I need to scan? What are we going to find out from it? And they will give you an answer and you'll say, what if we don't do it? And she'll say it's okay. But if you meet a care provider saying, I'm telling you, you have to do it, then you can be rest assured that at the time of birth also she will use the same language. Because that's how. So in your sixth month, into your seventh month, in your eighth month, you have chances of meeting other doctors, talking to other people who've had better birth experience or had experiences like what you want. So that's possible. That's one way of doing it. The second thing is that uh, if you have pressure from family, well, uh, can you have your partner on your side? Is he educated about it? So, you know, first is awareness. Do you have all the information? Second part is, uh, you know, knowing that can I take action on it? The action could be speaking to your doctor, action could be on your behalf, your husband or your partner or your family can do it, or can he talk to the family? Do you have that support or actionable people around you? Or you can change your doctor. If you don't want to argue with your doctor, you can simply change your doctor. Remember, you're paying them for your care. They're not doing you a favor. So you can find another doctor. If you are not the person who can do all that, then the third aspect, what would help me go through this with relatively more ability to talk? Right? Because if we keep talking about somebody else fixing our lives, that's not going to happen. Who can I fight? Which fight? You know, we are always in our mind. Our nervous system is designed to say, if we are threatened, can we fight? Can we flee? And the third one is fright. So we want to avoid fright because that's a numbing dissociative state. That is also the precursor of a lot of depression and feeling unloved and being in the world, disconnecting from the world and the baby. So we want to work with fright and fright, right? Can I speak up? Can I walk away? And who can I gather as my support? The ability to trust that process can only arise in me. That's my work. So that is birth preparation, not 100 duck walks. Well, that is true. But just 100 duck walks is not the preparation. That inward journey is also the preparation. So finding a doula, getting, talking to your, being on a community that supports you. So if you are on a platform that tells you who in your area is a doctor who's more sensitive to your kind of birth, you might choose your care provider. There are many different ways of being able to do awesome. Not always you have to be assertive because sometimes being assertive is the most traumatic thing for you. I can't be that way. Then you should have other. Right. So thank you for that. Uh, I think that was a very, very important part of this, uh, you know, entire experience you know so uh, Tanvi here asks uh, has a question about c-section and breastfeeding and she says uh, she asks is it possible to immediately breastfeed your baby after birth uh, yeah. you know after a c-section and then she also wants to know uh, that sorry the importance of the golden hour after birth so the golden hour is like the window it's the follow-through it's an important part of the baby's birth sequence. So even if there's a, what happens with a disruption is that if we disrupt it here, it has a telescopic effect. C-section, baby is taken away, so the follow-through is gone, the rest period, everything is gone. So when we can come back to the sequence, the golden hour can be that. The golden hour after birth is called golden because the baby is open to receiving uh, communication of coming into the world of safety of parents of habitat of everything but the instinct to do it is always there is looking that is the pathway of meeting the world so we can do skin to skin skin to skin is the pathway of, of in that golden hour we can bring the skin to skin 20 minutes later 
30 minutes later, two days later, we can use it as a repair. But the challenge in breastfeeding is that there is a disruption in the coming together. When the mother is lying on her back and cannot move because of anesthesia, whether local or otherwise, how does the baby arrive at the breast? We now know that babies can go upside down and drink it and suckle. We have done, uh, we, there are C-sections I have held hands in where my job was to make sure that the baby comes out and comes back on the mother. There is a little bit of a stop because the baby doesn't get the compression of the airway cleaning, so the doctors just check on, and then the baby comes back on the mother. So this mother, in preparation, has already made sure that her arm down can come off, that she's bare-chested on the OT table, and that one hour of stitching her back the baby has that golden hour with the mom. So for the baby, there was a small disruption where instead of pushing the way out, the baby was lifted out. And then life becomes, oh, this I recognize. My mother is here. And then the baby may cry and the mother says, it's okay. I know that was hard. That wasn't what you were expecting. But you are here now. We're safe. I'm with you. For the father, and then we get the guests and the relatives out of the room and the baby and mother together. And often breastfeeding, putting the baby and mother in proximity, not just breastfeeding, not stuffing the breast of the baby, so, but putting the mother and baby in proximity over and over and over again, where both of them can go back to that instinctive uh, mechanism that was that's laid down as code in our DNA of coming into the world. That's prepared both for the mother and the baby. Usually I've seen that, and this is from my own experience, uh, that after C-section, uh, the, the child is taken away for at least two hours. It happened in yeah. my case. And when it comes back also, it comes back in, you know, to the room, the hospital room. It comes back in, uh, you know, a, a part incubator, part bassinet kind of thing. Yeah. And then it is, uh, it's not really on your side, yeah. not even on the side. I think it's right in the middle of the room. Uh, so there is, there is no immediate contact with the mom at all with uh, C-section. And this is quite a sad thing. And uh, now that I think. And, and that baby is sleeping. You'll find that these babies will sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. It's checking out. It also has the same fight and flight mechanism. Is threatened, there's separation. I can't make sense of this world, but I know in my bones, in my core, that I cannot survive without my mother. So this is life and death taking taking me away from my mother. It's life and death for me. I don't have the perspective that, oh, you know, I'm in the nursery and the nurses are looking. That's not there. It's life and death. So what if I just check out? I just close my eyes and this nightmare might go away. We do that. When we feel really burdened with stress, we want to mm. check out. And the yes, other so. one is the really fussy, colicky, crying baby. No matter what I do, the baby is constantly crying. It's activating, it's mobilizing its body, asking for help. Mm. That separation is huge anxiety for the baby. And followed. it's following a disruption in sequence, which may have been done Without even, you know, there's a long disruption. It may be out of the scheduled C-section, take the baby out, take the baby away. Everything the baby knows about coming into the world and surviving has been stripped from him in the name of science. And there is no scientific basis for that. Right. So uh, here's another question. Is uh, Manisha Sood wants to know uh, some online platforms that help finding a care provider. I think My Child First is one. Uh, no, my, my Child First doesn't run a community that gives references, but Facebook has many. Hmm. Facebook has many, uh, but the best way to find out is to ask friends and family who they went to and what their birth was like. Also, if they say, oh, it was a really good, I really love my doctor, it was a really good birth. You say, okay, what did you want for your birth? I wanted a scheduled C-section. And she gave it to me, so we have a very happy relationship. So check, what did you want? What did you do? How did you prepare? What is your story? It might give you insight. But remember, their story is not your story because you're not there. 
So mm. if you really want, uh, you know, we talk about agency, we talk about autonomy, nobody's taken it away from you. We've lost it. If you want to reclaim it, go step by step. Make small assertions about yourself. Get to know yourself a little bit. Dive deep into yourself. Go to a good childbirth class. Uh, find a doula. Uh, they're very supportive. Um, so there are many such platforms you can get. Uh, we at My Child First actually don't put down because we're offering information. We're offering you windows or pathways. Uh, so when we say educate, we we'll just educate it. By giving you this time and holding your hand, uh, we do a childbirth class for sure. By holding out your hand, we are helping you integrate it. Information is plenty. We can't say that there's no information. It's, it's the digital age. But I find that more information is making people more angry. Because they don't know how to make sense of that information. That is right. why um, I, I don't know uh, if, if this irritates somebody or not, but my answers are really slow. I give you the reasons why I'm saying what I'm saying because that helps you make choices. That I'm not telling you right. I've not said anything is right and wrong because that creates the the fear. Right. So look at providers who speak this language. Absolutely. So I hope Manisha Sud is listening to this. Uh, Sanya Nair here has a comment. She says, children used to be kept in a common nursery with other kids. It's so sad to think about this practice that used to take place a while back. Yes, but also see yeah. the repercussions of the world we live in. We have no trust. Relationships are completely failing. Uh, we are insecure. As a, as a collective, think about what we've done to children in the last 50, 60, 70, 100 years and how the society looks today. Think about that. And can we repair it? Yes, absolutely, because love is the shield to all problems. So yes, but do you know that in Europe, the, the newborn nursery is now being converted into family rooms? Women and you know, families sit and breastfeed together and talk about birth, that's community. Awesome. Great. That was some awesome information and very eye-opening. I think a lot of uh, moms here have taken away, uh, you know, uh, a lot of good information, reassuring information. Manisha Sood here has something else to say. I'm looking for a care provider who can help me with my birth if possible at home, but haven't found many in North India. I'm in my fourth month. Would be very thankful if there are any care providers who you know of are willing to support a birth at home. Oh. Hmm. Um, there is a network of midwives who sometimes travel, but I don't know in the COVID situation if they are. Um, yeah, but she so, still has a lot of time. She's still in her fourth month, so she does have about five yeah, months. So I can, I can offer information about my local area because I've worked here for 20 years. We do have networks with other uh, birth networks with other cities. Um, let's see if we can find something. Okay. So Manisha, we will definitely get back to you. Thanks for being here and uh, being with us. Uh, thank you, Divya, for this wonderful, wonderful information, uh, this wonderful session. I had a great time. And thank you very much for, uh, you know, for being so authentic in, your, in the way you communicate these ideas. So thank you very much. We have another comment just as we are closing here. Um, yes, around 35 years, our babies are kept in nursery with other babies. Would you would only come? To mother for two three times in a day for feeding yeah you'll be surprised it's still happening in leading boutique hospital yeah yeah absolutely and then uh yeah here manisha says thank you so yeah thank you very much divya this was a great session we had a lovely interaction uh, did it and meet your I premise that it'll be new information <laughs> yes uh, some parts of it definitely Definitely for me, it was new information. I've been a mom for 15 years and uh, parts of it were new to me. I didn't know that uh, cesarean uh, also takes a toll on the baby. I didn't know that. So that was new information to me. So 
yeah i'm pretty sure it's been new information for some others here so thank you very much thank you all right bye thank you so see you all next week i forgot to say that we have this as a four part series so same time next sunday 11 o'clock we have the third of the four part series so please do join us and thank you very much have a lovely sunday thank you bye